<laughs> Thank you, Victoria. Welcome aboard the Trolley of the Doom. And now, in case you're not aware, you're all doomed. At least for the next hundred minutes or so. Yes. In fact, there's only one person on board this trolley who's immune to the doom, if you will. Unfortunately, it's nobody sitting in front of me. It's this gentleman here. Everybody say hi, Roger. Hi, hi Roger. Roger. See, Roger is going to be navigating us around the Isle of Bones this evening. Although I like to consider myself a relatively important person around these parts, Roger is truly the most important. I put so much trust in this man that I'm going to be facing the wrong direction as we travel through the wild, wild streets of Key Wild, Wild West. I don't even know where we're going. We'll probably figure it out along the way. You ever notice that I called this island the Isle of Bones? You know why we call it that? Anyone? Dead people. Dead people. Ow. Good answer. <laughs> See, over 500 years ago, when Spanish explorers first got to this island, Ooh. what did they find? Dead people. Yes. <laughs> Scattered human <laughs> remains of Calusa Native Americans. Leech white bones all across our lovely beaches. In fact, Russ Beach and Higgs Beach, as they are known today, were, well, covered with the scattered human remains of those Native Americans. They were a warring tribe. They would not bury their dead, as you can imagine. This is a uh, island of coral rock. It's quite hard to dig into. So instead, they just left them out on the beaches for nature to take care of them. Now, this is usually That's the point in the tour where somebody says, I just laid out on that beach today. Somebody else laid on that, laid out on that beach as well, and never got up. <laughs> See, it's an ancient spiritual belief. Spirits of the dead cannot cross over bodies of water. In case you haven't noticed, they're surrounded by water. The Gulf of Mexico is about a block to your left. The Atlantic Ocean is, I don't know how far to your right, but hopefully Roger does. <laughs> hopefully. Now, Along our way tonight, I'm going to be sharing with you strange tales of human tragedy. Stories of things that have happened on this here island. 500 years of maritime history from shipwreckers and cigar manufacturers and, and pirates. Much, much more. See, we're showing you the places where these things happen. The loved ones of passed away due to hurricanes, where we've seen to have ducked this most recent hurricane. Woo! Yes. <laughs> hurricanes, fires, floods, betrayals, murders, suicides, loss of loved ones due to diseases. There were two particularly heinous diseases that could be found on this island before the age of antibiotics. Now we have a relatively small group so far this evening, so does anybody know either of those diseases I'm referring to? Swine flu. Is that swine flu? Yeah. It's a little more recent. No. If you go back even farther, before antibiotics. The plague. Kind of like the plague, tuberculosis. Oh. It's somewhere in between the plague and swine flu. We had tuberculosis. Now, tuberculosis, it would start as a simple cough, and then they called it consumption. It seemingly consumed you from the inside out. You'd be bedridden for months before finally, gracefully, passing away. Now the second of these two diseases is the yellow fever. Now, the yellow fever was a very quick killer. It would start with colicky, yellowish skin, of course, a very high fever. Wonder how they got the name. And then, blood would spew from every orifice in the body. Even the pores of your skin. It's not a very sustainable way for a human body to survive, so you'd be dead within the week. Well, I'll tell you various tales about these two diseases tonight. As I mentioned, we're going to be showing you the places where these things happen. We're also going to be going inside two of them. See, many folks who have sat in the seats you're sitting in now experience some strange phenomena, such as 
a sudden chill or a heaviness in your chest. An unexplainable sorrow. Others still will feel like there's somebody watching them. You turn and there's nobody there. Or maybe you hear things. Children's cries or laughter. Or maybe footsteps from above, particularly in the first location we'll be visiting. That place is a shipwrecking warehouse. Inside this warehouse, well, there's also a tower above. You do hear footsteps. I can assure you, we will be alone. If somebody were upstairs, the alarms would sound. May just be a spirit from long ago. Other smell things, such as immense cologne or tobacco. Nobody will be smoking cigars along our journey, but you may get the hint from a cigar manufacturer or a shipwrecker long, long ago. While we cannot guarantee any ghostly experiences, being very aware of your senses is your best opportunity to do so. Do you think you might have felt something or seen something? Have you heard something? Take some photos. Not one, but a few. You see, you never know what you'll find. Some folks get an orb in their photographs. Anybody here familiar with orbs? Small little balls of energy said to be remnants of a soul attempting to reveal themselves to you. They come in various colors. Some of them are entirely translucent. Others still will get a haze in their photo. Whether black, gray, purple. No, Roger. Not that kind of purple haze. <laughs> you see others, other photos, they don't turn out at all. So, take quite a few, as I mentioned. Now, along our way tonight, I'm also going to be sharing with you a little bit about our culture, as well as our history. See, we're in a little island out here, in the middle of nowhere, basically. So we kind of developed our own culture over the years. You also may experience electrical anomalies, such as street lamps turning on. I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, that just happened to be the right time. Yes, our culture out here on this little island is a little different from anywhere else. Folks call it our conch culture, C-O-N-C-H. If you're unfamiliar with a conch shell, there's a stand of them in front of us to the left. Now, if you go out um, scuba diving or snorkeling and you see some of those conchs in the ocean, leave them be and heed my warnings. Because it's a thousand dollar fine for each conch taken out of the ocean. They're a protected species and they are much cheaper on the car. <laughs> they also have a nice glaze on them. <laughs> now the lovely Sylvia, it appears, will be showcasing one of these conks for us. She's uh, <laughs> like a modern day banana one. <laughs> My banana's fucking the job. You see, folks who are born on this island are known as conks. We've lived here for at least seven years. You're known as a freshwater conk. Honorary. They'll even give you a certificate there. Is anybody here at Conk, whether it be honorary or normal? Roger, how long have you lived here? Long enough. But you don't have the uh, the plaque, do you? I'm going to have to get you one of those plaques because he is an honorary Conk. See, they call us the Conk Republic as well. It was long, long ago. Well, not that long ago. Actually seceded from the United States. Not for long came back right around and uh, I believe it was less than 12 hours, but that's another story for another time. If you see one of these conch shells inside a home, I advise you to turn around and leave because it's said to bring the floodwaters with it. It's actually the ocean reclaiming her children will go inside of your home and take that conch shell with it. So leave it on your front porch if you do choose to take one home with you. See, we have lots of superstitions like this on this island. In fact, in many of our historic homes, you may have noticed they have beautiful gardens and patios, right? Front porch, maybe a wraparound porch, maybe a double-decker porch. Is anybody here staying in one of these historic homes during your time here? Or? Well, if you do go wander
wander around Old Town and see these houses. Notice something about the porches, <laughs> the porch ceilings in many of these places. They're painted uh, blue. It's not just any blue. A particular shade of blue. It's known as Haint Blue. Now, Haint is a haunt, is a haunt with a spirit of the dead with bad intentions. <coughs> now, the word Haint comes from the language Gullah. It's a Creole language spoken by former slaves in South Carolina and Georgia Low Country. You see, why would they paint their porch ceilings this particular shade of blue? Any guesses? Well, it's said to represent water. And those spirits of the dead will not cross the threshold of a home with a porch ceiling painted paint blue. So, what happens if you have a porch ceiling painted paint blue, but you already had spirits inside before you painted it? The trap. Or do you sage, sage those spirits away? But other things we'll encounter along our way are those folks outside of the trolley who are, well, a little less refined than yourselves. See, I know we're all cultured patrons of the arts here, <laughs> but these folks outside, they may be possessed by liquid spirits <laughs> and as such they may feel compelled to shout at you all <laughs> we'll be traveling around town and they'll see you, the trolley of the doom coming and they will point to you and they will say you're doomed <laughs> well you know that already right <laughs> so we're going to respond to them in unison with a singular voice echoing throughout the streets of old town Upon my count of three, we will say five simple words. Yes, we are the doomed. <laughs> Think we can handle that? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Well, we're going to have to overcompensate a little bit because we have some empty seats here, but... Oh, you know what? I'll have Sylvia help us out. Hey, Sylvia. This is my favorite part. Just listen to her say you're doomed in store one. Sylvia, can you remind us all that we're doomed? One, two, three. <laughs> yes, we, we are, are the doom. <laughs> I think that will suffice. <laughs> We're missing people. Well, let me. Well, I'm going to get a real quick head count. Please keep your heads on your shoulders for now. I think I can handle this many people. We got nine. Yeah. It's supposed to be 11 or 12 or something. Well. We'll wait for them a little bit longer, and then they're dead to me. <laughs> how, many, how many tickets do you have? Oh. If you haven't noticed the chickens, it's time to sober up. <laughs> they're everywhere. See, they actually also have superstitious origins here. They were originally brought because, as I mentioned before the railroad got to town, we didn't have a whole lot of uh, room for grazing, but a family of chickens could feed a family of humans for a few generations. And then the settlers from Cuba, the Bahamas, they came here, and they brought with them the mysteries of not only Santeria and Voodoo, but the sport of cockfighting. It's very, very popular on this here island well into the 20th century. It was made illegal. They actually set those chickens free. They ran the streets, and they still run the streets. Now, along our way tonight, you may encounter various different types of hauntings. There are four that are particularly common on this here island. Uh, the first of which is known as an intelligent haunt. Because they, these are usually the result of a particularly sudden or traumatic death experience. Or maybe a spirit simply has unfinished business to tend to. They can actually interact with living beings, such as yourselves. And although I'm not quite qualified to classify myself, I'd like to be considered intelligent. Wouldn't they all? <laughs> now our second type of haunting is the residual haunt. The residual haunts occur when a blast of energy enters the atmosphere in a particularly emotional part of somebody's life. These events are then played out over and over again in a loop. They're imprinted on that location. Roger, I don't know about you, but sometimes I also feel like a residual haunting over and over and over again in a loop. It's approximately 90 minutes. Our third time of 
13 people have leapt to their own demise from the rooftop observation deck. It's a spa now. How relaxed. Yeah. You see, a very well-known event that occurred in this building was New Year's Eve of 1982. A young man named Brent Hookshot cleaning up on the fifth floor after a New Year's Eve party. He had a cart loaded with dirty dishes. He pressed the elevator button behind him and he waited for those doors to open. When he heard the elevator doors open, he simply stepped backwards, pulling that cart. But there was no elevator cart there. Oh. Yes, he plummeted down the elevator shaft five stories to his demise. Oh. Well, folks staying in this place have reported just after midnight. There are screams coming from the elevator. Others have seen the ghost of the image of a man making the same journey on the fifth floor. It is a lovely hotel. Yeah, we're staying there. Yeah. It's nice, right? <laughs> now we're just down the street from the oldest house in South Florida. Any takers on when the oldest house was built? 1820s. I don't know if I actually heard it, but somebody thought it. You see, the 1820s, they built this home, and it was finally completed in 1829. It was once the home of Captain Francis Watlington, his wife Emmeline, and their nine daughters. Yeah, well, the captain was a very busy man, of course, and a prosperous wrecker, as well as a politician. On one of his many business trips away from home, the yellow fever struck. One of his daughters came ill, died within the week. And his second daughter showed the same symptoms. Emmeline felt she had no choice rock her in her rocking chair until she drew her final breath. Well, on your left is the oldest house in South Florida. And you see behind this window all the way to the left, this is what was once the children's nursery. This is where Emmeline rocked her daughter, comforting her until she drew her final breath. And the curator of the museum has said he can still hear that rocking chair. The residual hauntings of Emmeline rocking slowly, rhythmically, mourning there's a rather large mansion to your left. It's green. It's known as the Porter House. You see, Captain Dr. Joseph Yates Porter was born in this house in 1847. Eighty years later, he died in the very same room he was born in. But for years, he studied the yellow fever. You see, in this home, he would conduct experiments using quarantines. In fact, some summers, up to 50 victims of the fever would die in this here home. Now, today, it's not one bar, but two. Inside, many folks have reported glasses being thrown from the shelves. Others can hear music and laughter coming from upstairs, or even a sudden chill in the room that Captain Doctor, Dr. Porter was born in and died in. Dr. Porter, still trying to cure the incurable. Oh, well, there's poltergeist activity in that building as well as intelligent and residual hauntings. We're well on our way to a location housing all four of the types of hauntings. You see, this place is dedicated to the many ships that have wrecked upon our reef over the last 500 years or so. You see, it's not very well known, but in the early days of Seafaring. Most folks who worked on boats actually didn't know how to swim. <laughs> so, when their ship would wreck, they would cling on to anything they could, physically or spiritually speaking. See, unfortunately, many lives were lost during these shipwrecks, but it also created quite a bit of profit for those who would loot them. You see, straight ahead you may be able to see a tower looming above the square. If you can't see it now, we'll all see it very shortly. See, this is a replica of those shipwrecking towers that could be found on our island on the go. This one stands 65 feet in the air. Those back in the day were 85 to 100 feet in the air. And mind you, they did not have our modern OSHA regulations when they <laughs> built them. However, 
Those shipwreckers would stand on top of the shipwrecking tower, peer out upon the reef. When they saw a ship wreck ashore, what would they cry out? Wreck ashore! Of course. These cries of wreck ashore would echo throughout town, and these shipwreckers would get in their small shipwrecking ships, head out to the shipwreck, and gather all the shipwrecking treasures they could. Does that make sense? Well, this small boat to your left is one of those shipwrecking ships. This is the Mary. She's seen better days, but I don't know about you, but I would not want to go out on 30-foot waves in a boat that size. Just what these shipwreckers did. Now, inside this building, there's various treasures for the many years of shipwreck. But there's also other things, such as a shadow figure, seems so often we've given it a name, and a piece of cursed Spanish treasure you'll get the opportunity to touch and hold. Well, we'll be going inside. You're more than welcome to stay with Roger if you'd like, but he's pretty creepy too. <laughs> As we enter, behold the tower above. Welcome, folks. You're good. Feel a sudden chill when you walk inside. It's probably the AC. <laughs> We're gonna gather around the banister in the center of the room. Plenty of space for everyone. Oh, it feels good in here. We're gonna gather around the banister in the center of the room. Now oh, it does appear as though we have everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to Key West Shipwreck Treasures Museum. Because that's what they call it during the daytime. You see, we're actually standing above a cellar, a basement cellar. And that's quite rare for Key West. We are right at sea level. You see, back in the day, if you had a basement cellar, they would use it as an ice house. What types of things would you need to keep cold? But your food, of course, but also corpses. Fresh dead bodies. Exactly. You can only imagine on days when the summer heat got too much where those ice blocks would melt. The stench that would emanate. Now the particular basement cellar below us may not have housed many corpses, but keep that in mind for later this evening because I will be uh, showing you another one of these basement cellars. You see, this building, in this building, paranormal activity has been on the rise over the last 11 years or so. Just over 11 years. And we think it's due to a singular event that occurred during the early morning hours of July the 1st, 2008. You see, uh, that night, one of our motion detecting alarms was triggered. Nobody responded to the alarm, so nothing was done that evening. The next morning, as a young man climbed the tower to raise the American flag, it became quite apparent that a tragedy had occurred on the tower above. That tragedy may have even left a spirit behind. You see, shortly thereafter, one of our museum managers was cleaning up after the end of a long night, making some notes right around here, when he noticed some movement to his left. He thought it was his own shadow stretched out beside him, but there was something strange about him, so he turned to face it, and he stood still as the shadow kept moving along that wall, up that ceiling. It was quick with spider-like movements, long, thin appendages. It was terrifying at first, but it became a regular occurrence. In fact, it was so regular these coworkers were commiserating one evening, and I'm told coworkers often do. <laughs> And this time, they found they had all seen the same shadowy figure along that same wall. It didn't start appearing until after the tragedy on the tower. So they thought they must be two spirits, one and the same. In their attempts to help that spirit find peace, and also in an attempt to help themselves find peace with the spirit, they decided to refer to it ever so affectionately 
as Daddy Long Legs. Well, Daddy Long Legs still appears to this day. And shortly thereafter, that same motion detecting alarm was triggered once again. Only this time, two police officers and museum manager reported to the scene. They checked the basement, this floor, the tower, they found nothing. Reset the alarms and went home. Same alarm went off a few hours later, that very same night. The same three men were called to the same alarm and they were awoken from their slumber again and quite frustrated about it, to be frank. So, they decided they'd split up. Thought it'd go faster. One officer to the basement, one on this floor. The museum manager took to the tower above. Once they were separated, the man on this floor, he began to hear bang coming from all four walls, from the outside, simultaneously. I don't know if you folks noticed, but we did go up some stairs to get up here. He, said, he radioed out to a patrol car waiting in the square, and he said, I know we're close to Duval Street, but really there's people banging on all four walls. Well, the squad car in the square reported back that he had seen nothing, heard nothing. I don't know what you're talking about. Ooh. The man in the basement didn't hear anything either, but he did see something. So he was doing his due diligence, checking behind each and every one of our lovely artifacts, looking in each and every alcove and corner. But when he turned to come back upstairs, he came face to face with the apparition of a large man. He was pain troubled. Like he needed to get something off his chest. But the blue-gray figure didn't say anything. They maintained eye contact, seemingly acknowledging each other's presence. And the ghostly man turned and walked straight through a concrete wall. Well, both of these police officers were terrified. So they ran to the museum about as fast as they could. As they compared notes and caught their breath, the museum manager came down from the tower above. He reset the alarm and he realized something. The date. It was July the 1st of 2009, the one year anniversary of that tower tragedy. You see, the same alarm was triggered two more times that very night. No physical intruders were ever found. Just last year on the 10 year anniversary, well, this tower was struck by lightning. Every year things get a little strange around July 1st, and including the alarms going off on the 11th anniversary in 2019. If you come back July 1st of next year, you'll find I'll be on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> However, I also believe I mentioned something regarding cursed Spanish treasure, yes? Well, if I didn't, I should not. <laughs> I direct your attention here. This silver bar, 64 pounds of silver. You see, it's no secret that Spanish conquistadors in the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries and on, went to Central and South America in order to gather all the treasures they could. The queen, of course. This is one of many silver bars taken from Ecuador. Ecuador. And you see, this silver bar was put on a ship in Ecuador in 1655. It sunk just off the coast. The following year, 1656, these queens spent another fleet to salvage this silver bar along with hundreds of others. You see, they gathered that treasure and it was put on by the, a ship by the name of Nuestra Señora de las Maravillas, Our Lady of Marvels. Now the Lady of Marvels made it to the Bahamas until a, a January storm sent that fleet swirling in circles. Maravillas was at the rear of the fleet, the Capitana leading the fleet reared around, broadsiding the Maravillas. Both captains knew the end was near. The captain on board the Maravillas instructed his priest, as, good with, as with every good Spanish vessel, he said, Father Diego, please bless our men, for we all go to our watery grave. Well, Father Diego went down the line until those two ships wrecked upon a reef. Of the 350 men on board the two ships combined, only, only 44 survived. Well, Father Diego lived to tell the tale. According to him, it was the 43 men who he blessed that managed to survive alongside him. I don't know if you believe Father Diego or not, but I do know this. 
The following year, the Spaniards sent another fleet to gather this treasure that sank to the bottom of the ocean. Fame deal two more years later. In fact, this thing, this silver bar sank five different ships before finally, in the 1980s, 1986, a man named Herbert Humphreys Jr. led an expedition to get it here. Never did make its way back to Spain. We do have a few moments. If you'd like to touch it, lift it, take some photographs, help yourselves. Hopefully, Roger will be waiting for us on the trolley of the dune. Is it? there? She's going for it. It's Go ahead.
Angela. And in time, Angela gave up her night job in order to move in with him under common law as man and wife. Well, all was well. Young love at its finest until that fateful night in December of 1921. You see, five or six of those hooded figures crept up the back stairwell into their apartment and beat Islano within an inch of his life. Their brutal message was clear. Do not lay with Angela of mixed Afro-Cuban descent. Well, the next day, Angela could patch her man's wounds, but not his pride. He had a ruptured kidney, and the doctors said he would die within a few weeks. So with nothing to lose, he took his army-issued revolver, set out to the streets, looking for the one man he had recognized the night before, William Decker. He headed up and down Duval Street in the cab until he finally spotted Decker. And he leaned out the window of that cab, he looked him right in the eyes, and he said, this is how a man kills another man. Bang! Ooh. Shot him dead in the street. So Asanio knew he would be hanged for his crime, so after a little bit of a resistance, he went ahead and surrendered, and they brought him to the old jail, a small white building behind these buildings here to your right. But he never did get hanged for his crimes. Instead, later that night, the sheriff, Roland Curry, instructed his men to vacate the premises. I have this under control, and uh, don't worry about it. Be with your family. So later that night, five or six more of those hooded figures pulled up to the jail. This time with no guards, no sheriff, and his cell door mysteriously unlocked. They waltzed right in and they beat him to death. They dragged his body to the outskirts of town, lynched the dead man from a palm tree, tarred and feathered his corpse, and even shot him up with shotguns for good measure. It was cowardly overkill, if you ask me. Well, in time, a grand jury convened in this courthouse to your right. And it was here, in this small town where everybody knows everything. Nobody seemed to know anything. No one came forward with any information, so no arrests were ever made. You see, justice will still prevail, just not the legal kind. If you recall, the lovely young Angela, Islano's common law wife, you see, she would get justice for her man her way. She remembered what her grandmother had taught her about Santeria. She called upon the Orishas, divinities within Santeria, that each had their own special powers, ability. See, she burned some incense, lit some candles. She sacrificed a chicken and called out to heavens. She said, death to those who have harmed my husband. In time, all six of those men got exactly what was coming to them. Gruesome revenge. The first to go was that double-crossing sheriff, Roland Curry. See, he went out fishing with a large crew of men, was thrown overboard. And those who watched said he seemingly didn't even try to swim. His eyes were open, and he sunk to the bottom of the ocean. Revenge. The second ago, he too was fishing, only thrown overboard, crushed by his own boat on the reef. The third, fishing as well, only he went out alone and never returned. No signs of him or his boat. The fourth man had tuberculosis, long, painful journey to death. The fifth, working on the railroads connecting the keys. It was a mysterious dynamite explosion that took only one casualty. <laughs> now the sixth and final man took 14 years before he finally got what was coming to him. It was the Great Labor Day Hurricane of 1935. They never did find any of his remains. All six of them got their rightful revenge. Now that wasn't the only terrible hurricane to ravage this island. You see this building to your left? Well, it's a lighthouse, quite obviously. Did I say your left? Because I meant your right. <laughs> There's a lighthouse to your right. There is not a lighthouse to your left. And there used to be a lighthouse straight ahead. But there's not a lighthouse there anymore either. You see, this lighthouse was built in 1847. But it's the second lighthouse built on this island. Because the original lighthouse... How many times can I say lighthouse? The 
The original lighthouse was built in the 1820s towards the end of this street by the southernmost point. You see, it was constructed of bricks and it marked the dangerous shoals of Whitehead Spit. But in 1846, the Great Havana Hurricane descended upon this island with winds up to 200 miles per hour. In category five in your modern terms, so I've been told. You see that other lighthouse that was down here crumbled to the ground. Inside, holding refuge, Barbara Maberty, the lighthouse keeper, as well as six children. Well, they managed to survive as the lighthouse crumbled around them, but when the winds destroyed, the waves reclaimed. They dragged those six bodies out to sea, never to be seen again. As for Ms. Maberty, she miraculously survived, looked out the rest of her days at the new lighthouse. It's behind us now. Well, that lighthouse was one of two things built on the south side of the island, the other being our settler's cemetery, the original cemetery. You see, this is before we do to entomb our dead. Quite the lesson to be learned. That storm surge scoured up the ground and scattered those human remains in. They're dangling from the bushes and the trees, uh, like those lights in that yard to the left. When folks emerged from their homes the next day, they found their loved ones spewed amongst them. A mixture of bones, fresh guts, who's? Nobody knows. <laughs> so they had no choice but to regather them all, bury them in a mass burial site somewhere here on the south side of the island. Now the exact location of this burial ground has been lost to the sands of time, but it seems the residual hauntings are effervescent. Now we're traveling along what we call South Beach, a little bit different than South Beach up in Miami, but it stretches from the southernmost point to the White Street Pier. We've been using this part of town for burials at various points over the last 150 years. In fact, you can almost picture it. The war was on concrete and resorts. Nothing but the cool, soft sands of the beach. <laughs> Palm trees swaying in the wind. And a beautiful view of the pristine blue ocean. <sighs> Sounds like the perfect place to spend eternity, don't you think? Well, think of it this way. Particularly if you're staying on the south side of the island, go for an evening stroll. Maybe a bike ride like this gentleman. And just remember that you never know what or who lies underneath your feet. We've been finding bodies here. Say we're doomed. One, two, three. Yes, we are the doomed! <laughs> it's the same bar every night, every tour. <laughs> very recently, in the 18, or excuse me, that's not very recently. Very recently, this millennium, 2002, we began to find some bodies that we thought would be lost for good. They were hidden from us for the better part of 150 years. You can almost picture the scene. May of 1860, spring had sprung. The U.S. Navy's patrolling the Florida Isles in search of ships containing illegal cargo. Human cargo. They found three. The William, the Wildfire, the Bogota, all three American-owned, flagged, and operating as slave vessels. On board these three ships, a combined over 1,400 African children between the ages of 12 and 16. Many had already died due to the inhumane conditions of their voyage. Many others were diseased. Well, they weren't sure what to do with them, so they brought them to the nearest U.S. port. Key West, of course. It was here, U.S. Marshal Fernando J. Moreno put them up in our barracks for Fort Zachary Taylor. About a mile back that way. And you see, Fort Zach was their home for almost 80 days. The good folks of Key West did everything in their power to feed, clothe, comfort these children. 
thousands of miles away from home. But that cycle of disease and death that started in the slave ships continued in the refugee camps. And, well, survivors were taken to newly formed Liberia in West Africa to live as free men and women. But those 294 of those refugees, they never left our island. They were buried here instead. Now, a local carpenter, Daniel Davis, built each and every one of them their very own coffin. And then they buried them in the sand on a remote beach. Now, mind you, this is 150 years ago, but that just so happens to be this remote beach. <laughs> Good folks at Key West would not soon forget this atrocious event. The following year, the US government's getting ready for the Civil War, so they decided to build two more fortresses on our south side of the island. The Martellos, they were dubbed, each a mile and a half away from each other, about as far as a cannon could fire in those days. Put the West Martello down directly on top of where those African refugees were buried. Now, our local army engineer objected, but it was overruled. They dug deep into the ground and scattered those human remains without taking any note of where they put them. As I mentioned, we thought they were lost forever. You see, on your right is West Martello Tower. That's all that remains of that fort. But in 2002, local historians using a ground-penetrating radar and a map of the old beach they began to find these graves in the sand. See, on your right is our second burial ground of the evening. Well, let me out real quick. You folks are gonna stay on board. You're welcome to stand up if you'd like. I'm gonna try to see if we can give you a better look at this African cemetery. You see, today it's a lovely memorial. It's known as the African Cemetery. And right here, I'm currently standing on a mural of Florida. Cuba is directly behind me. Africa, to my right, your left. In the center, a compass rose. There are also 15 ovals outlined in the concrete. These are 15 graves. Each only two to three feet below ground, three to five feet long. Should the children buried here? Well, there's also proverbs from Africa all along the outer edge. It is a lovely memorial if you do get the opportunity to visit it. However, see, these 15 graves weren't all they found. More recently, in 2010, across the street to your left, this place is dedicated as a green space today because there are over 100 more of these bodies buried there. Nothing else will be built here except for another memorial. And while I know we'll never be able to hear their stories, know their names, I, for one, am simply glad that they're finally getting the respect that they deserve. A moment of silence, please, for those lost on our island. Now, I believe I mentioned that summer they started to build two forts. The West Martello, just behind us, and the appropriately named East Martello. We're headed there now. I mentioned it's about a mile and a half away. By day, it's a lovely museum run by the Key West Art and Historical Society. Inside, a beautiful collection from early Native Americans found on these beaches to your right, to cigar manufacturers, uh, ship wreckers, and much, much more. They are closed for the night. However, we are permitted inside. And I must warn you, that night, at times, the, un non the unknown stirs. The unusual happens. As I mentioned, folks sitting in the seats you're sitting in now have experienced strange things, to say the least. Well, we do go inside. It's quite parent, they can take as many photographs as you would like, in fact, we encourage it, and of course, 
All four of those types of hauntings I mentioned earlier are present inside this location. The clairvoyant visiting the grounds has said there are at least seven different entities that call it home, one of which has been there long before the fort itself. Now, I may have mentioned that the Key West Arts and Historical Society runs the fort. That's technically true. They're the ones who allow us entrance at night. However, when we do get inside, we play by somebody else's. Robert's rules. Robert the doll, of course. I mentioned earlier, a strange doll, result of uh, what may be a curse of voodoo, he's got a strange intelligence about him. He tends to mess with people, to say the least. Some of a paranormal pop star, he's been featured on CBS News, Mysteries at the Museum, Ghost Adventures, Deadly Possessions. William Shatner and Ozzy Osbourne both had television programs where they visited him. In fact, just a few short weeks ago, a group from the Travel Channel had a camera crew on our trolley. But they weren't here to see me. I'm sorry, Roger, they weren't here to see you. <laughs> they were here to see Robert the Doll. He was even taken to the Atlantic Paranormal Society's convention in Clearwater, Florida, where enthusiasts of that which exists beyond scientific explanation, such as extrasensory perception or telekinesis, they hover around this doll. They found that Robert has an aura. An aura much like a living being. It's blue on the top, it's purple at the bottom. It denotes a certain curiosity and intelligence. He's a strange doll. <coughs> Some find him cute, but looks can be deceiving. Others find him creepy. I wouldn't say that to his face. He stands about 40 inches tall, dressed in a in a sailor's outfit, and is made of a wood wool known as Excelsior. Thought to be made in the image of his constant companion, Robert Eugene Otto. You see, Mr. Otto was given the doll when he was only four years old. The doll was given to him by his Bahamian nanny, which seems like a very nice gesture. Until you realize that she was dismissed from her charge, and, well, that was her final parting gift. Seemingly making that doll follow the boy around for a lifetime. Well, things got a little strange around the house. Mrs. Otto thought she heard her sweet young child speaking to the doll. They were fast friends, inseparable. But she also thought she heard a second voice responding with insistent, demanding command. Accompanied by some mischievous giggling. Well, between the doll and the boy, it was decided the boy would go by his own middle name, Gene. The doll would take the boy's first name, Robert, which is a little strange for a four-year-old to decide, but the name stuck for a lifetime. And then some. You see, things got even more strange about the house. Toys would be broken, and Gene would say, Robert did it. Clothing torn, Robert did it. <laughs> Furniture moved around the room, much too heavy for a four-year-old to move. Well, that's because Robert did it. In fact, anything at all that went wrong, his answer was always the same. Robert did it. See, Gene grows up, he travels the world as an artist. In the meantime, Mrs. Otto thought that doll was so problematic, she put it in the attic turret tower room and threw away the key. So he lives the rest of his life unhindered, grows up, travels the world. In Paris, he met and married Anne, a concert pianist. And then they came back to his family home here in Key West. That's where Gene changed. So he demanded the strange doll be brought down from the attic. And he would paint in seclusion with only the doll by his side. Well, rumors began to swirl. He grew abusive towards his lovely bride. On a wellness visit, they found Anne locked in a closet. What do you think Gene said? Robert did Robert it. Did. Robert <laughs> did it. Gene died in 1974. He's buried in our Key West City Cemetery. You can go visit the Otto family plot, but you won't find Anne there. Because Anne took the doll back up to the attic, threw away the key, 
sold the house, left the island for good, never stepped foot on this island again. I'm sure you'd do the same. You see, the house changed hands a few times until the mid-90s when the doll was donated to Key West Art and Historical Society. They keep the doll here at the East Martello Fort for safekeeping. Now, we won't be going inside the East Martello, but as you notice, Roger kept driving. That's because we don't go through the front door. No, that's where you go if you want to visit during the daytime. But we get exclusive nighttime access to the back door, the back gates, the dark side, if you will. Now, as we do go inside, it's quite important that we stick together as a blue group. Please gather all of your personal belongings. Take plenty of photographs while on the fourth grounds. But most importantly, stick together. We wouldn't want to leave anybody behind. Thank you, Roger. That new name is Roger and Robert. Are you still here? Wait some for us. <laughs> Folks, we're going to enter, head inside to the right. I'd like to welcome you all to the East Martello Fort. It's a beautiful night at the fort. Please oh. stay along the pathway, or there's no holes everywhere. Ah, beautiful view of the silver moon this evening. And along this wall to your right, in particular, many of those orbs are captured. That's what you get for leaving me. One night I was coming home from a party and I got struck by lightning and it is here that I remain with Robert. Now my darlings, please do come follow me and stay on the path. As you know, there are lizards afoot. <laughs> All right, my darlings, the East Martello was built in 1862 as the third Union stronghold in Key West for the Civil War. All of these bricks had to be brought in by ship from Maine because we did not have the tools here to make these bricks. To the left, this is the Citadel. Its walls are eight feet thick and it was known as the Gibraltar of the Gulf. It was supposed to be the last holdout in case the Confederates made it across the front lines. Even though not one shot was fired upon these grounds during the Civil War, 365 Union soldiers died here of the dreaded yellow fever. And unfortunately, that's what we had to use the Citadel for as quarantine for those 365 Union soldiers. And that is where they perished. Now, my darlings, do stay on the path, and I shall take you all to meet Robert. All right, my darlings, before we go in to meet Robert, it is very important that we understand his three rules. Number one, upon meeting Robert, kindly introduce yourself. Number two, ask permission for his photo. And number three, out of respect, say thank you to Robert. All right, my darlings, come on in. He's only been waiting 114 years to meet you, and tonight is the night. Welcome, darling. <laughs> <laughs> oh, All right, my dears, here he is. Everyone, say hello to Robert. Hello, Robert. Hello, Robert. When Robert was first brought into the East Martello, the groundskeeper was out patrolling. 
patrolling the grounds, when all of a sudden all the lights turned on, which is no way humanly possible because there are four fuse boxes and you would have to flip the switches all at once. Robert did it. <laughs> the first curator brought Robert in here and she put Robert up against the wall. Robert did not like that, nor did he like her. One day she was busy punching out her time card. She felt a swift kick out her booty and as she turned, she looked and saw a small child running down the corridor of the East Martello, dressed in a sailor suit. Robert did it. She screamed and ran out, never to return. Over here we have letters from people just like you from all over the world who have come to visit Robert. Upon the time of their leaving, they felt that misfortune had befallen upon them and that they had disrespected Robert in some sort of way. There is our address in case you feel the need to write us such a letter. <laughs> now, my darlings, do remember he's only been waiting 114 years to meet you, and tonight is the night. And look, he's smiling. See how happy Robert is that you all came out tonight to meet him. Gets really lonely sometimes, right, Robert? Thank goodness he has little baby Leo with him all the time. Yeah. Yeah, actually, so people think it's a little dog, but it's actually a little lion, but he's also 114 years of age. Wow. Yeah, and so thank goodness or else he would be so lonely. If anyone has any questions about Robert, please feel free to ask. Hi, Robert, can I take your picture? No. <laughs> thank you. Oh, you were playing. Don't play. <laughs> she was going. That's her. right. You heard her. Look at it. And she's so happy. Robert has That's a rules. <laughs> oh, really? Well, I made sure the rules one and three are covered, so all you have to do is ask permission if you'd like a photo with him. <laughs> Only do what you feel comfortable doing. That's all that matters. You all made it out here tonight. You all made it inside tonight. And there he is. Yeah? He is. He loves beautiful ladies. Yeah. Look at that big smile. Mm -hmm. You introduced yourself to them? What? That's a, like a proclamation for a hundred and first. It's actually a birthday, um... Birthday card. Yeah, from George W. Bush, and that one's from his brother Jeff. Yeah. This yeah. first one is from George W. Oh. Oh. You see, we in Key West, we will dress our deceased in their finest attire and parade them around town. Then we take them to their church for a wake. We bring them back home in their casket for one more night's stay at their home. The next day, they are greeted at their front door by a percussion ensemble. It is known as the Key West Junkanoos, and they originated in the islands. They start out somber in the morning and break down to a spiritual celebration all the way to the Key West Cemetery. And we still practice this in Key West to this day. Over here we have a tombstone from our Key West Cemetery. This is of Carolyn Lowe. Carolyn Lowe was a Confederate sympathizer in a Union town. And when the Union troops would march past her house, she would wave her Confederate flag, tormenting and taunting them. And when they raided her house, they couldn't find it because Carolina kept it hidden under her petticoat. 
as irony would happen shortly after she passed away, February 15, 1898, in the Havana Harbor. The USS Maine was blown up, triggering the Spanish and American War. So the Union soldiers of Key West decided to take Sweet Caroline's tombstone, a Confederate sympathizer in a Union town, and dedicate it to the fallen Union soldiers of the USS Maine. This is what we call recycling in Key West, folks. Bye-bye, Caroline. <laughs> and the soldiers of the USS Maine are buried in our Key West Cemetery, and every year we still do a memorial in honor and tribute to them. Now, my darlings, if you're all ready, I'd like to draw your attention to more tombstones from our Key West Cemetery. Remember, Robert is not demonic. He has known love his whole entire life. Wow. Yes. So he's just simply mischievous. Oh. And it all has to do with respect. Like say for instance, somebody comes in, disrespects them, and then it comes back to that person amplified. So absolutely no worries. I mean, we had one guy one night, he came in, he had little, and he started beating up a little Robert the doll that he had purchased. He sent a letter this long. And then he actually flew in from New York to come apologize. <laughs> oh yeah, it was serious, it was going down. <laughs> but that's what you get. <laughs> All right, my darlings, we have over 100,000 people buried in our Key West Cemetery, but such little space. So how do we do this? We simply dig up the casket of the ancestor of the recently deceased and bury the newly deceased relative on top. We may have as many as nine generations in one crypt, tomb, or mausoleum. And we still practice this to this day. Then we simply take the old tombstone of the ancestor and replace it with the recently deceased relative's tombstone. Over here we have a tombstone that was once in our Key West Cemetery. This was of the beautiful Elena Hoyos, until one night her mausoleum was mysteriously blown up. And this was all that we were able to piece together. Over here we have an effigy of the beautiful Elena. May she finally have some peace in the afterlife. And this story of Elena Hoyos is coming up next on the trolley of the doom. And there she is, an actual picture of the beautiful Elena. Truly magnificent. Bless you, darling. Thank you. All right, my dears, have we all had enough time with Robert? Yes. Let's all say goodbye to Robert. Bye, Robert. Bye, Robert. Bye, Robert. And we're going to go back out on the grounds. Now, my dears, do remember what you do not see with the naked eye. You may be able to capture on camera. Orbs, apparitions, electrical anomalies, truly magnificent. Remember, there are very good spirits also, and people have actually captured their guardian angels on these grounds. All right, my darlings, right this way. All right, my dears, we shall be venturing towards the right. All right, Robert Lavo, see you in a bit. All right, my dears. One night, the groundskeeper was out patrolling the grounds. When all of a sudden, there he looks and he sees a man standing up against that wall. He yelled at that man, what are you doing here? No one is allowed on this premises. Just then, the man turned to look at the groundskeeper. He realized he had two cross-fired rifles emblemed on his hat. Then he saluted and walked through that wall. Numerous ghost hunters have been here, and what they have found is the most paranormal activity occurrences happened within that wall. 
There are a series of tunnels that align all the way around the East Martello, but that is where the activity was the highest. All right, my darlings, I do have a question. This gentleman asked, what is this little dollhouse? No, it is not Robert Summerhouse. <laughs> but the truth of it is, the Key West Art and Historical Society took over the East Martello in 1949, which is why it is so wonderfully preserved. And they use it as a museum during the day. In fact, inside the Citadel now, it is a statue garden, and you can actually go to the top of the Citadel, and it has an excellent view of the Atlantic Ocean. Hmm. Well, one of the first English families that landed in Key West were the Wolkowskis. They built this dollhouse for their daughter, and they passed it on from generation to generation until finally the last Wolkowski he left the island and they donated it here so that it would be well preserved mm -hmm. and actually we just lost David Wolkowski at the age of 99 mm -hmm. and he just donated his key which is known as Ballast Key hopefully soon to be renamed David Wolkowski Key to the Nature Conservatory so we were truly blessed to have him for so many years he was a great great man um, if anyone else has any questions, please feel free to ask. All questions are good questions, and you never know unless you ask. Anyone? So he had his own island when you say he had his own yes. island? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ballast Key. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and he just passed away actually, and he donated to the Nature Conservatory, and they're working on changing the name to David Wolkowski. And yeah. I'm assuming he lived on there? He had a house on the city? Um, actually, he lived right down on Flagler Street here, and then he owned Ballast Key, yes. He, was, he owned numerous. Um, the Pier House was one of his hotels. He came for money, and he could have retired at 40. Instead, he decided to um, restore Key West, actually. So, like, the original, like, walkway... Um, near Mallory Square there, all the bricks, and it's all like old school Key West. He's responsible for that also. Yeah, he wanted to restore a lot of the homes. They wanted to bulldoze them. Instead, he paid to have them removed and um, renovated and fully restored. So he was really interested in preserving the history and the culture. So we are very, very blessed. And the key is just amazing on what he donated, yes. And he was always there, I mean, for everything. Even at 98, he was still, you know, in the Women's March and this and that and still very active. He was an amazing man. I knew him personally. I was very fortunate. Yep. Anyone else have any questions? All right, my darlings. Now we are going this way and we are searching for orbs. They appear to be tiny, minute cells of light. They may appear to be fluorescent green, iridescent, blue, purple, all different colors. Twenty-year-old sapodilla trees, great big beautiful banyan trees, trees we'll never see again in this lifetime. Since this occurrence, we have had these green orbs presenting themselves to us. They are tree spirits, and they want their presence to be known because they all want us to realize that trees do have spirits. And once again, this is the area where those orbs have a tendency of congregating. Once again, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. Anyone? 
All right, my darlings. I do encourage everyone to say goodbye to the spirits of the East Marcellus so they do not follow you along your journey. Goodbye. 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 Thank you. They're staying with me. <laughs> How many people knew they were coming to the southernmost point of the United States to come to a union stronghold? <laughs> See, now when you leave here, you can make bets and win. <laughs> all right, my darlings. I wish you all safe journeys. Thank, Thank you, you for coming out. Thank you. All right, my dear, you're more than welcome. Have a wonderful Thank you evening. Very much.
clear across the island to Rest Beach. It's up the street from here, where my old butcher shacks once were. And it was here, on the beach of a subtropical island, that this metal object sat during the summer, the human body inside. And Elena began to rapidly deteriorate. Folks were coming from far and wide just to see the strange contraption. The Count grew paranoid of somebody might find or smell his dirty little secret. So he did the only logical thing. He brought her into his own home. Yes, he lived on a shack just off of Flagler Avenue a few blocks from here. And it was here that things seemed a rather macabre turn. See, the Count decided to take those effects of decomposition into his own hands. And he fitted her corpse with tubes put copper wires in a little tendon, stuffed her body cavity with rags where her organs once were, used mortician's wax and plaster to replicate her once perfect porcelain skin, then put glass eyeballs in her eye sockets, wove her a wig made from her very own hair, even recreated her yep. feminine yep. anatomy yep. with silk, dressed her in a white wedding gown, and laid her down in his very own bed, where they yep. lived together mm -hmm. as man and wife for seven years. What? Oh my god. Yeah. Oh yeah. God. <laughs> well, in time, an actual neighborhood grew up around this man's once abandoned shack. Folks so were weary of the man living on their block. He was seen throughout town, purchasing women's clothing, perfumes, but nobody ever saw him with a woman. Strange. In fact, a local boy was snooping around past his bedtime, and he claimed to have seen the man dancing with a life-size doll. Folks could hear organ music coming from his house throughout all hours of the night. And eventually, the rumors of this strange man got back to the family of Elena Hoyos. And they remembered how obsessed he was with Elena. So they decided on a hunch they'd check back in that mausoleum. Of course, Elena's body was missing. So, Elena's little sister, Florinda Hoyos, Nana Hoyos, she stormed across the island and practically broke down the door of the Count. But the Count, he opened the door with a smile. He said, welcome. I was just about to sit down to dinner with my lovely bride. <laughs> Would you care to join us? <laughs> so Elena's sister <laughs> enters the room. She's led to the dining room table. What does she find propped up at the dinner table? But Elena Hoyos, wired, waxed, in a white wedding gown, oh. nine years after she had been married. Yes, these mm -hmm. are photographs. What? Well, Elena's sister uh, was mortified, to say the least. She got the proper authorities involved, and Police officers came to arouse, arrest the Count on charges of grave robbery as he innocently explained that he was just trying to bring her back to life. Well, they decided to give the Count a psychiatric evaluation. It was here that they found the Count to be 100% completely, entirely sane, sound of mind, and fit to stand trial. He was just trying to bring her back to life. <laughs> As the Count's awaiting trial, our local Key West funeral home, they got their hands on Elena. And they were so impressed by the Count's handiwork. They decided to put her on display. Three whole days. Over 6,000 people came to see her. Oh my gosh. They 10 cents a piece. Including school children who were let out of school early just to see the sights. The U.S. is something else, is it not? Yeah. <laughs> Always has been. 
always will. That's well, after the lovely Elena's three days in the spotlight were up, although some would argue she's still in the spotlight today, <laughs> she uh, was reburied in an undisclosed location. And in fact, the only three men who knew where she was buried have since passed away themselves. They all claim to have taken that secret with them to the grave. There are rumors, though. Some say she's somewhere in the city cemetery. Others say they chopped her up into little pieces and fit her in an 18-inch box. Mm. We will never truly be sure. But we do know what happened to the Count. You see, when it came time for the Count's trial, practically our whole town crammed into that small courthouse we saw a short time ago. You can see here the Count, somewhere around here. There he is. He could not face his accusers. When the prosecution team got together, they found that the Count could not be prosecuted at all. Statute of limitations on grave robbery was two years. He was with his bride for seven, so he had gotten away with it. Well, with no charges to hold him on, they were forced to let him go, and he demanded his wife be returned to him. They did not give in to these demands. So in a fit of rage, he split town, headed for Zephyr Hills, Florida. Actually, lived out the rest of his days there in Zephyr Hills, creating wax replicas of Elena, yeah. making postcards about her, and even writing pulp fiction about the secrets of Elena's tomb. Oh my God! It's truly the American way. Prompt yeah. off your strange story. Wow. <laughs> All love stories have a happy ending. You see, <laughs> the Count was found dead in his home in 1954, slumped over an effigy of Elena. Cardiac arrest. She was truly a heart stopper. <laughs> <laughs> You see, this part of town here is quite nice. You'll find many of our lovely historic homes, including this one, with a hate blue porch ceiling. Double decker, no less. You see, this part of town not always was not always this nice. In fact, a few short decades ago, this is not a place where I would bring fine folks such as yourselves. There's nothing but bars, bordeos, gambling dens, cockfightings in the streets, and some very friendly women. For a price. <laughs> now, on any given night, there would be murder and mayhem, stabbing, shootings. You name it. However, these were particularly dangerous streets when shrimpers came to port. You see, shrimpers would work long, hard days out on the ocean. If the catch was bad, they would stay out for weeks. No whiskey, no women, no fun to be had at all. No entry reports of call. They would actually finally come back here when the catch was made and be paid in cold, hard cash. And then spew from those boats like war rats, hit the bars, bordeos, gambling dens, and of course, the brothels above the bars. Well, the most dangerous bar of all was known throughout all the Gulf Coast as the Bucket of Blood. It's real name, the Red Door Saloon, built in 1868. The Red Door Saloon was so dangerous, how dangerous was it? They say that if you entered without a weapon, they would issue you one at the door. <laughs> Just to make it a fair fight when it inevitably broke out. Now, upstairs in the Bucket of Blood was also a brothel. They renovated it into apartments a few decades ago. Sounds like a lovely place to live. You see, on your left is the Red Door Saloon. It still has those iconic red barn doors. But as you can see, it is a much more classy establishment today. The only fight you'll find inside is a vertical clearance rack. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you see, we're just up the street from the house that Mr. Nosby haunts. Who's Mr. Nosby? I bet Roger knows. See, Mr. Nosby was the primary caretaker for Miss Grace Kemp. She lived alone in her family home until the day she died. They knew how dangerous this neighborhood was. So, on every single night before he left, he would lock and latch each door tight. Back, on stormy nights, he would stay.
stay on a cot in the laundry room. Well, what used to be the laundry room is now guest roommates of the lovely Cypress House Hotel. To your right, is this main building on the corner where you may see the shadow figure in these garments on a stormy night. May very well be Mr. Nosby. Others still emerge from their room in the night for a drink or a smoke. They return to find the door has been locked, latched tight from the inside. It's Mr. Nosby, still looking after Miss Grace. In fact, if you stay in guest room eight, what used to be the laundry room, you may feel that sudden chill of Mr. Nosby. You see, it's one of the many houses that have changed over the years, to say the least. They've been repurposed, reused, rebuilt. You're picked up at your own doom. One, two, three. <laughs> yes, we are the doom. <laughs> it is not quite apparent yet from places such as the Red Door Saloon or the Porter Mansion. The repurposing of these bars has resulted in some fairly morbid watering holes. You see, over the next few blocks, you'll see a lot of locations that look like housing, but nobody lives there. Unless, unless, of course, you count the locals who can be found on the same bar stool night in and night out. You see, one particularly morbid bar is known as Shots and Giggles. It's a very small white house just behind it here to your left. But not all those shots rang out with laughter. You see, over the years, one man who used to own this house, he lived there, his name was Frank Fontes. He was a local socialite, never one of the party to end. He was found on that very front porch, dead, surrounded by duffel bags of money. Ooh. He never did solve who did it, but it seems he still doesn't want the party to end. It's since been turned into the bar, as I mentioned, and those bartenders, they've told me personally, they'll put the bar stools on the floor, on the sh they'll put the bar stools on the bar, turn the music off, take out the trash at closing time. And then they come back inside after taking out the trash to find the bar stools are back on the floor. The music's playing again. How did I turn that off? Well, as I said, it seems Frank still doesn't want the party to end. Now, over the next, as we cross through Wall Street once again, we're headed to another strange bar. In fact, this big building to your left is now Sloppy Joe's. But Sloppy Joe's actually started a block up at what is now known as Captain Tony's Saloon. Now, before it was Sloppy Joe's, it was actually one of those uh, morgues I mentioned earlier. One of the only places with a basement cellar that they used as a morgue. So if you lose some of your loved ones on the streets of Duval, you may find them in the same location. Others claim their loved ones in a body bag. On your left is Captain Tony's, and if you look through this set of open doors, you'll see a tree. It's a tree in that bar. Oh, yeah. See, a few oh, decades yes. ago, Captain Tony was enclosing a courtyard. He was going to chop that tree down. So he found out that it's rumored to be the hanging tree. So he kept it for ambiance. Now, there's two headstones in the bar itself. Underneath the tree is Reba Sawyer, 1957. Underneath the pool tables back here is Elvira Edmonds, 1826. Ugh. You see, it is to ladies that these two women appear in the restroom. Maybe you're looking in the mirror, freshening up, doing whatever it is you do in there. And you see in the mirror that there's a woman behind you. Blue, gray statue. She looks not happy to see you. You turn, she's gone. Just Elvira still hanging around. <laughs> I can go see if she's in there tonight. Others might want to go get a drink with the good doctor. I am sure he is in. Or maybe go to Shots and Giggles. Might even find your ghost host there. But if you would rather wait till tomorrow, go visit some of these locations by daylight, you can actually climb that tower above at the shipwrecking warehouse. I have been told that the view is to die for. <laughs> Others still might want to go visit Robert the Doll at the East Martello Fort and apologize. You know who you are, and so does he. <laughs>
You see, unfortunately, we're heading towards the end of our journey. I do hope some of you have enjoyed yourselves almost as much as I have. And if you did, let us know. If you had a physical ticket, you now have a comment card. You can fill that out, stick it in the mail. Postage prepaid courtesy of Historic Tours of America. I guarantee you our operations manager reads each and every single one of them. Otherwise, it is unfortunate that my undone livelihood may rely upon your positive TripAdvisor and Yelp reviews. <laughs> so let them know that the Butcher and Roger showed you around this island with class. Or something like that. <laughs> okay. You see, you, if you had any particularly good photographs, you can share those with us as well. I know I died over 150 years ago, but I still keep an eye on our Facebook page. <laughs> okay. Ghosts and Gravestones, Key West. I'd like to thank you all for joining us this evening. Can we please give a round of applause for Roger? Yay, Roger! Hey, Roger. This evening. <laughs> you folks have been a wonderful group, and uh, who knows? Maybe we'll just raise enough money to get him a CDL and make this. <laughs> <laughs>